So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's bite-sized look at some of the differences between English and Scots law, which impact documents that we commonly come across in finance transactions. My name's Lindsay Lee. I'm a senior associate in the Brodie's Banking and Finance team, and today I'm joined by my colleagues Taiba Chowdhury, Megan Club, and Neve Johnston. First of all, just to signpost some of the things that we're going to cover in today's session and to set the context. In cross-border and international deals where we have English and Scottish assets involved, we typically have Scot security documents governed by Scots or English law, as the case may be. Where the assets are located impacts the documents themselves and how they are signed, so we'll be looking at that. We're also going to look at some areas where the Scots law way of taking security interacts with other legislation and also at some changes on the horizon which could simplify matters in Scotland. We've tried to pack as much content into today's session as we can for you, so we will just crack on and I'll pass over to Megan to talk to us about equity. Thanks, Lindsay, and thank you everyone for joining us this morning. So before we can discuss the differences in terminology and the different documents you may expect to see in Scots and English law banking transactions, we first need to highlight a key difference between the two jurisdictions, and that is the concept of equity. And the key point to take away in this context is that unlike English law, Scots law does not recognize the concept of equity or equitable securities, equitable rights or equitable transfers. And this has a significant impact on how security is taken between the two jurisdictions. So under English law, a security over assets can be legal or equitable. For example, as we'll come to later on, a mortgage can be legal or equitable. The difference being that a legal mortgage transfers legal title to an asset and an, <clears throat> excuse me, an equitable mortgage transfers the beneficial interest in an asset. Charges, on the other hand, are always equitable as they involve no transfer of title. So the key advantage in having a legal rather than equitable security interest is that a later legal security interest will take priority over an earlier equitable one if the later interest was taken in good faith and without notice. However, in certain circumstances, having an equitable security interest is preferable to having a legal security interest. For example, as Taibo will explain later on, it is more usual to take an English law charge over shares rather than a legal mortgage, and this is due to the administrative burden and risks involved with becoming the legal owner of the shares. Also, and quite importantly, equitable security in the form of a charge or equitable mortgage can be used to create security over future assets, whereas legal security interests cannot. A charge or equitable mortgage can be created, which attaches to the asset as soon as it comes into the ownership of the charger. Um, in Scotland, however, without the concept of equity, the lender either has a right in security or it doesn't. In Scotland, if strict legal requirements for security to be constituted are not met, then there is no security over the subjects. So in today's session, we will look to consider the different types of security documents you may come across, depending on whether security has been taken in Scotland, England, or in some, some circumstances, both jurisdictions. So firstly, looking at a debenture. A debenture is generally an English law security document, but as we'll see, it can, if correctly drafted, cover certain Scottish assets, and it can be granted by Scottish companies over English assets. In England, lenders can take security over all assets by means of a debenture. A debenture can create fixed and floating charges over all of the grantor's assets. And in practice, a debenture will be used, for example, to create fixed security over stock, plant and machinery, shares, bank accounts, and insurance policies, and to create a floating charge over any assets not captured by the fixed charges. As a debenture includes a floating charge, it can only be granted by certain types of borrowers, such as companies and LLPs. In practice, a debenture will create a fixed charge over the assets of the company which are not disposed of in the ordinary course of business, and a floating charge over the rest of the company's undertaking to capture any assets that have not been caught by way of a fixed charge. Under English law, security can also be taken individually over these assets should there not be the requirement for an all-encompassing debenture. On the other hand, here in Scotland, 
we don't in practice use this type of omnibus security. Generally, a lender will take an all assets floating charge where it is competent for the borrower to grant a floating charge and separate fixed security is taken over specific assets. Floating charges are a common feature of banking transactions in both England and Scotland where the borrower is a company or an LLP. Floating charges can capture the whole property and undertaking of the grantor from time to time. As its name suggests, a floating charge essentially floats or hovers above the assets of a company until such point that it is either discharged or it crystallizes. This allows the company to retain possession of the assets and use them as required in their general course of business, including to buy, sell, replace, or otherwise deal with the charged assets. So if we go back to what I was just saying about equity, English law floating charges are always equitable. Often, English floating charges charge those assets which are not covered by fixed charges or assignments created in the debenture, whereas in Scotland, the approach is generally to seek an all assets floating charge, and that will cover assets which either cannot be secured by a fixed charge or are tricky or have implications if secured by fixed security. So Taiba, for example, will explain some of the risks around taking a Scots law share pledge and some lenders may decide instead to rely on their all assets floating charge. So looking now at some of the other differences between English and Scottish floating charges. So a Scots law floating charge only crystallizes on certain insolvency events, which are noted on the slides. An English law floating charge, on the other hand, will typically contain automatic and voluntary crystallization provisions that will state that the floating charge will automatically convert into a fixed charge over the assets without action by the lender. And the lender has the right to serve a notice on the charger converting the floating charge into a fixed charge over the assets. These notice and automatic crystallization provisions in an English law floating charge will not work in relation to Scottish assets. Instead, the charge will continue to float until crystallized in accordance with the Scotch, Scottish rules. Looking at enforcement, Scottish floating charges are enforced by way of administration, unless the floating charge is one granted prior to the Enterprise Act 2002 coming into force. And if that is the case, limited rights to initiate receivership would still apply. Law of Property Act receivers do not have authority in respect of Scottish assets. When it comes to priority, generally fixed charges rank higher in an insolvency than floating charges, which also rank behind preferential creditors, such as HMRC, and are subject to the prescribed parts, which is an amount of money set aside for unsecured creditors. However, Section 4641A of the Companies Act 1985 provides that if certain language is included in a Scottish floating charge, that language has the effect of conferring priority on the floating charge ahead of any subsequent or fixed or floating charge. Uniquely, under English law, if a fixed security is invalid or ineffective for any reason, it can be recharacterized as floating. There has been a series of English cases about charges intended by the parties and expressed in the security document to be fixed, being recharacterized as floating. The courts will look at the rights and obligations of the parties in relation to the charged assets. In particular, they will look at whether the security holder is in control of the assets or whether the charger is free to deal with the assets. But there is a whole spectrum of possibilities between these two extremes, so every case has to be assessed on its own facts. Because Scots law does not recognise the concept of an equitable security, a fixed security in, Scot in Scots law will not be recharacterised as a floating charge. So if a Scots law fixed security is invalid or ineffective, it will simply fall. Now, Taiba is going to mention registration of security documents later, but I just want to highlight at this point that alterations to a floating charge granted by a Scottish company or an LLP need to be registered at Companies House. So we've included on the slides the sort of alteration that would trigger the need for a filing to be made. The most common form of instrument of alteration is a ranking or intercreditor agreement, which would be entered into where two or more lenders each take a separate floating charge from the same company. <laughs> 
So you may be thinking, can an English law debenture create effective security over Scottish assets? Or what happens if a charger has assets in both Scotland and England? The case of re-anchor line Henderson Brothers Limited 1937 looked at the scenario of an English governed debenture that attempted to secure assets located in Scotland. It's important to note that at that time, floating charges were not recognised by Scots law, and therefore a floating charge could not be granted over Scottish assets. The English courts, however, ruled that the charge was effective because it met the requirements of English law. So, it is possible that the English courts will hold charges created under English law over assets held in a different jurisdiction as effective, even if that jurisdiction does not recognise the charge. And following this decision, the English courts will recognise a fixed security over Scottish property. However, in order to enforce that security, it will be necessary to bring the fixed charge before the Scottish courts. The Scottish courts will apply the English court's decision on the English law debenture as far as they can, but they will not recognise any security over Scottish property that does not comply with Scots law, and examples of this can be seen on the slide. So, faced with the unenforceability of the fixed charges, the lender will look to rely on the floating charge, which is recognised by the Scottish courts. However, the Scottish courts in recognising the floating charge will also recognise its governing law. By applying the decision in the Ankerling case, the fixed charges are effective under English law, even though they are unenforceable in Scotland. And as a result, the floating charge fails to catch the Scottish property covered by the fixed charges, leaving the chargee with no enforceable security over that property. It's therefore essential if a debenture is to cover Scottish property, that the floating charge is stated to extend to all assets situated in Scotland, whether or not effectively charged by the fixed charges and assignments. So to sum up, if the floating charge contained in the debenture is clearly worded and adapted for Scots law, it can cover Scottish assets. Although in most instances where a floating charge is to be granted by a Scottish entity over its assets, this will be done by a separate standalone Scots law floating charge, rather than relying on a floating charge mechanism in a debenture. And as we've explained, separate Scots law fixed security will also require to be taken. So we'll now go on to discuss security over heritable property. Heritable property can be defined as land and things built or growing on the land. So in Scotland, a standard security is the only mechanism of taking security over heritable property. A standard security is often referred to as a mortgage due to the terms being used interchangeably in relation to standard securities over residential properties over the years. Understandably, mortgage is a much more user-friendly term for the general public. However, there are some key differences between a Scots law standard security and an English law legal mortgage. A standard security is a creation of statute and is contained within the Conveyancing and Feudal Reform Scotland Act 1970. And its sole function is to enable security to be taken over heritable property by anyone who requires to do so. A standard security can be both granted by and in favour of individuals and companies. A standard security can be granted over land or a registered lease if it's for a period of longer than 20 years. In order for a security to be perfected, the Stein standard security must be registered against the title number in the Land Register of Scotland. If a company is granting the security, the standard security also has to be registered at Company's House, and Taiba will discuss this later in the session. In England, as I've mentioned, there are two forms of mortgage, legal mortgage and equitable mortgage. And this, again, is due to the law of equity being recognised in England. The criteria for these two types of mortgages are listed on the slide. Legal mortgages are governed by the Law of Property Act 1925. Equitable mortgages, on the other hand, are not governed by statute. However, they are recognised by Section 90 of the 1925 Act. In England, if security over heritable property is being granted by way of a debenture, the debenture will detail the type of mortgage and any perfection steps that are required to create a reliable and enforceable security. Again, both of these charges have specific registration requirements, which will be discussed in more detail shortly.
And I'll now pass on to Taiba, who will look at further differences between the two jurisdictions. Thanks, Megan. So firstly, we'll take a look at the similarities and the differences between Scottish and English shared security. We'll start by looking at the English law position first, as that is a little more straightforward. So security over shares in an English company can be created in two ways. Starting with a less common method, security can be taken by a legal mortgage of shares. To create this type of security, the shares have to be transferred into the name of the security holder. This, as we'll see, is more aligned with the Scottish position. However, much more common is for share security in an English company to be taken by an equitable share charge. Under this type of share charge, the shares are not transferred to the security holder at the time the security is granted. So where a share charge is granted, the grantor will typically hand over to the security holder the share certificates with signed but undated stock transfer forms, which will only be dated in the event of enforcement action being taken. Under English law, a share charge gives equitable security rights even though the shares are not transferred to the security holder. As we progress, we will see this is very different from Scots law. Now moving on to the Scottish position, in contrast to English law, under Scots law, security over shares in a Scottish company currently can only be created by transfer of ownership of those shares to the security holder. Scots law does not recognize equitable security. So if the shares aren't transferred, the lender has no security right at all. They only have a personal or contractual right against the grantor of the share security to have the shares transferred to them. When Scots law share security is taken, signed and dated stock transfer forms are handed over. The transfer of shares is registered in the company's register of members. This is called perfection and signed share certificates are issued to the security holder, which could be the lender or its nominee or a security trustee in a syndicated deal. There are a number of points that we need to consider where share pledge is concerned. In no particular order, first we have group company implications. Because the security holder has to become the registered owner of the shares to get a security right, there's a risk that the underlying company could be treated as a subsidiary of the security holder. Generally, this risk is avoided by drafting the share pledge in such a way which provides that voting and dividend rights remain with the grantor. And the aim of this is to ensure that the grantor continues to be the holding company for the purposes of the Companies Act. If the share security is in force, the delegation of voting rights to the grantor of the charge will usually end. Then we have the PSC regime, the risk of the security holder being a person with significant control in respect of the underlying company and all the obligation that carries with it. Unfortunately, there is no settled view on this amongst practitioners in Scotland. Next, the National Security and Investment Act 2021, the risk of having to notify the UK government of the share acquisition before the security is perfected, with the sanction of fines and the share security being declared void for failure to notify, or of the share acquisition being called in for review by the UK government. We will discuss more about this later on. There is also pension liabilities exposure, the risk of being called upon by the pensions regulator to contribute to making good a pension deficit if there is a defined benefit pension scheme in the group. I'm sure you'll agree there is so much more to consider on these issues and we can do an entire webinar alone on each of these issues, but I'm just highlighting them because these are a concern which arise because of the way in which share security has to be taken under Scots law. These issues will also be relevant to an English share mortgage, although these are uncommon because of the issues I've just highlighted. These issues will generally only become relevant to an equitable English share chart on enforcement. The last point I'm going to make on this subject is that it is possible to avoid each of these issues by taking an unperfected Scots law share pledge. By this, we mean that the shares in the underlying company are not transferred to the lender. It's more akin to the share charge under English law, 
But the important takeaway is that under Scots law, an unperfected share pledge does not create a right in uh, security in favor of the lender. The lender only has a contractual right against the grantor. And in an insolvency situation, the lender would be treated as an unsecured creditor and would rank after any fixed and floating charge holders and other preferential creditors. Moving on to assignments and assignations. So an assignment under English law or an assignation under Scots law is a transfer of incorporeal or intangible property, such as the rights to payment of a debt, rights to sue, rights under a contract, such as building, construction contracts, or supply contracts, and so on. Although the names are quite similar, there are some crucial differences between a Scots law assignation and an English law assignment, and we'll look at those. Key things to be aware, aware of with Scottish assignations, where we don't have the concept of equitable security, an assignation has to be outright. So ownership of the right has to be transferred to the assignee or lender for the period of the assignation. The assignation has to be perfected, and this is done by intimation, that is the giving of notice to the relevant counterparty. Without intimation, in the case of an assignation in security, no security interest is created unless and until intimation takes place. Contrast this with the position in England where there are two types of assignments that can be used in a finance transaction, a legal and an equitable assignment. A legal assignment is that, like a Scots law assignation, requires notice to be given to the other party or parties. An equitable assignment, however, requires no notice to be given. In a financing transaction, an equitable assignment brings various advantages. The assignor may not want its funding arrangements to be known. For example, if a book debt is subject to an equitable assignment, the debtor would not need to be informed that their debt has been assigned and could continue to deal with the assignor. And sending notices to all counterparties can be a massive exercise where, for example, in a loan book portfolio assignment, there are multiple underlying debtors. Aside from the requirements or not to give notice, the only significant difference between a legal assignment and an equitable assignment is around the bringing of actions. Where there is a legal assignment, the assignee or the lender has a right to enforce the assigned rights in its own name. In an equitable assignment, the equitable assignee or lender often cannot bring an action in its own name against the third party contractor, but must fall back on the rules governing equitable assignments and join the assignor as party to the action. We're now going to briefly consider Scottish and English signing formalities. I'm going to focus on signing by companies and the different legislative framework are on the slide but different rules apply to signing by individuals, partnerships, overseas companies, local authorities and other bodies. Looking first of all at English law contracts, English law agreements can be deeds or contracts, also known as contracts underhand. Certain agreements, for example, powers of attorney, have to be signed as deeds, and there are certain additional formalities around deeds, like the limitation period for deeds, which is the period that the parties can rely on the contract after completion, is longer than it is for contracts, 12 years as opposed to 6 years for contracts. In banking transactions, English law security documents are generally signed as deeds. Contracts which are not deeds are signed on behalf of a company by a person acting under its authority express or implied. And whether the agreement is in wet ink or electronic, that is how the English law contract or the deed is signed. Turning now to Scots law contracts, written Scots law agreements can be validly signed and if they meet certain higher signing standards, they can be self-proving or self-evidencing. This means that they're presumed to be validly signed by the parties. Under Scots law, it is banking practice to have the security documents signed, so they're self-proving. The slide shows how a Scots law self-proving document and an English law deed can be signed. 
So for wetting contracts, there is quite a bit of overlap between execution of an English law deed and a Scots law self-proving contract. Scots law has some added flexibility. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Moving on now to consider electronic signing. When it comes to electronic documents, things become quite different. As I mentioned, under English law, the practice is to sign electronically in the same way deeds would be signed in wet ink. So for example, two directors could sign electronically and a director before a witness, noting the requirement for physical presence of the witness. As you'll see on the slide, Scots law distinguishes three levels of electronic signature in ascending order of security. Next slide, please. The only way that a Scottish law contract can be signed in a self-proving way by a company is by the highest form of electronic signature, a qualified electronic signature. This involves the signatory's identity being verified by a qualified trust service provider before the signature is issued with a qualified electronic signature. Next slide, please. A company can sign electronically by a qualified electronic signature being applied by a director, a company secretary, and an authorized signatory. It's worth noting that for Scots law documents signed electronically, having a witness sign adds nothing, as Scots law does not recognize electronic witnessing. Also, self-proving status is required for documents to be accepted in certain registries, such as the Land Register of Scotland, but that register isn't currently set up to accept electronically signed documents. So these documents, for example, standard securities, need to continue to be signed in wet ink and self-proving for the time being. Just a final point on signing, Scots law has a further requirement that the document is printed in full, so not just the signing page before signing. There is also a requirement that there is operative text on the signing page, so not just some or all of the testing clause. This is actually a common pitfall in multi-jurisdictional transactions. To finally finish off, I'm going to very briefly touch on differences in registration. So registration formalities and respect of security is broadly similar in Scotland as in England. The Companies Act 2006 creates a uniform regime for registration of security against UK registered companies. One difference to note, however, actually relates to ranking agreements or intercreditor agreements, altering the terms of a floating charge granted by a Scottish company. So where such an agreement is entered into, a company's house form 466 needs to be registered against the charger under the relevant floating charge, as Megan touched on earlier. This is uniquely a Scottish point because it isn't needed where the charger is an English registered company and as usual there's the same 21 day registration requirement as with security documents so it should be remembered. I will now pass on to Neve to discuss the NSIA in a little more detail and also helpful changes on the horizon. Thank you Megan and Taiba. In this last section of today's webinar, I'm going to highlight one particular challenge which lenders taking security are faced with, and that is the National Security and Investment Act 2021. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm also going to look at how the Movable Transactions Scotland Act 2023 will modernise taking security in Scotland. So turning firstly to the National Security and Investment Act 2021, the NSIA is a UK-wide act, but it has greater implications for Scots law security because of the requirement to transfer ownership in the secured assets to create Scottish security. NSIA issues mostly come up in relation to share security, but issues could also arise in relation to other types of security, for example, assignations in security of partnership interests. The National Security and Investment Act 2021, or the NSIA for short, came into force on the 4th of January 2022 and gives the government powers to scrutinise and intervene in business transactions such as takeovers to protect national security. So just to summarise some of the key features of the Act, 
it applies to acquisitions of certain qualifying entities where a trigger event occurs. Broadly, a qualifying entity is a UK entity which falls within one or more of 17 specified sectors. Sectors which come, a lot, come up a lot in our transactions include energy and communications, but you can see the breadth of the sectors covered from the slide. Within each of the sectors, there is a very technical definition of what is covered. For example, in the energy sector, a minimum energy output threshold applies. Trigger events generally include acquiring varying thresholds of shares in the entity or voting rights in the entity, and an acquirer has to seek government approval if a trigger event occurs in relation to a qualifying entity. So why is all of this relevant? Well, what this means in practice, for example, is that if a Scottish lender is taking a Scots Law share pledge of 100% of the shares in a Scottish company, which is fairly standard, and that company is within, say, the energy sector or one of the other specified sectors, then the lender would need government approval before perfecting that security. Most importantly, for those involved in deals is the Act's mandatory notification obligation. Acquisitions which are within its scope will be void if they complete without first being notified to and approved by the government, with the acquirer vulnerable to significant civil and criminal, criminal penalties. As you can imagine, this has cost implications and needs to be factored into the transaction timeline. The decision, therefore, is for the lender in this situation to either seek government approval before taking the security or to take an unperfected share security and rely on an all assets floating charge. That isn't ideal for the reasons that we've already mentioned, including ranking only as an unsecured creditor on insolvency. A variation on that would be for an initially unperfected share pledge to be taken so a transaction can complete without delay and have the clearance process run as a condition subsequent. Again, there, the lender does not have fixed security unless and until government approval is obtained. As the NSIA trigger events are centred on acquisition of shares and voting rights, there are implications for Scots Law share pledge is on the following. Firstly, on the taking of the security itself, where a shareholding trigger occurs on the transfer of the shares in the company to the charge holder. On the enforcement of the share security, where the transfer of voting rights from the charger to the charge holder is a trigger. On enforcement, where the shares are to be transferred to any third party. Or on the discharge of the security, where the transfer back of ownership of the shares to the charger is a shareholding trigger. This can include discharge of securities taken out before the NSIA came into force, i.e. the NSIA wasn't an issue when the original share security was taken, but if the share security is discharged now and the company is in a specified sector, it will be an issue for the discharge. So just to complete the picture here, for an English law share security, although government approval is not required to the granting or taking of the security as the shares remain in the ownership of the charger, on enforcement, when voting rights and or title to the shares transfer to the charge holder, the same issues, as I have mentioned above, in relation to Scot Scottish share pledges will also be relevant. So that highlights one issue that we are seeing arise increasingly often in our transactions where share security is being considered or taken. The Movable Transactions Scotland Act and further legislation expected from the UK government alongside the MTA should remove a number of the challenges that arise because of how Scots security interacts with other legislation, including the NSIA. So as many of you will be aware, the Movable Transactions Scotland Now Act was passed last month and received royal assent yesterday. 
The Act introduces wide-ranging reforms to the Scots law of assignation of rights and security over movable property and heralds one of the most significant changes to Scots commercial law for many years. As has already been touched on by both Taiba and Megan, using Scottish movable property as collateral to fund a business prevent, presents challenges. This is because transferring or granting fixed security over these types of assets requires giving notice to third parties, making registrations against specific assets, or taking possession of specific assets. The Movable Transactions Act aims to alleviate some of these issues. So what key changes does the Act make? Well, the Act makes two primary changes to the existing law. Firstly, it introduces a new form of security that can be granted over Scottish movable property, known as the statutory pledge. And secondly, it creates two new registers to be set up by registers of Scotland, the Register of Assignations and the Register of Statutory Pledges. So looking firstly at assignations, some of the key changes which the legislation will make appear on the slide now. So what this all means is that registration upfront in the register of assignations of a transfer of, for example, book debts or rental income from a property will affect a transfer of present and future book debts and rents as they arise without the need to give notice to customers or tenants. Registration of an assignation or statutory pledge will take place online and the new registers will also be searchable online. These new methods of taking security are in addition to existing mechanisms which will be retained in parallel. Retaining the existing ways of taking security gives flexibility to take account of the different types of transactions involving different types of movable assets in different situations. It will also make it easier for lenders to transition their business systems and practices to the new regime. So, the point to take away about the new statutory pledge is that as the legislation as currently drafted exists, the new form of security cannot be used for share security. The original draft of the bill did include the ability to create security over shares in a Scottish company. However, the Scottish Parliament concluded that it didn't have devolved legislative competence in relation to shares. So, Separate UK legislation will be made, which will bring in the changes necessary to enable Scots law share security to be created by the new statutory pledge. This means that a lender would simply register the share pledge in the new register of pledges rather than have to take title to the shares. This would align the Scottish position more closely with that in England and the implications under the NSIA the PSC regime and pensions legislation, et cetera, would not arise on the taking of security, but would still be relevant on enforcement. So that is a bit about the Movable Transactions Act in bite size. However, if anyone would like any further information about the Act, there are lots of resources on the Brodie's website and an earlier Banking and Finance Academy on the Act is available on our YouTube channel. So that now brings us to the end of the presentation part of the webinar. So I'm now going to hand back to Lindsay, who will take forward the Q&A part of the session. Thanks, Neve. Um, I know we're tight on time, but it would be good if we could squeeze a question or two in. Um, and just coming back to you, Neve. So, and we are very excited to call it the Movable Transactions Scotland Act as of yesterday. Um, Scottish share pledges were originally meant to be in the new regime. They're not currently in the new regime, but they are hopefully going to be brought in. Is that right? And do we have an indication or any visibility on timescales? Yes, that's right, Lindsay. So the Scottish Law Commission had originally recommended that the statutory pledge should cover financial instruments such as shares in a company, as there is high demand for reform for the reasons that we have all touched on today. Um, but as I've mentioned, the Scottish government did take the view that these issues are reserved to the UK Parliament. So it has instead sought an order from the UK government under Section 104 of the Scotland Act 1998 to be able to take reform forward. 
So what this means is that we should see Scots law share security covered by the new regime, but it's very much in the hands of the UK government at the moment. Um, in terms of timescales, we are anticipating that the Act will come into effect in the second half of next year. So the hope is that shared security aspects will be brought in as soon as possible after that. Thanks, Neve. So watch this space, but positive change on the horizon for sure. Um, just picking up, Taiba, if I can, on one thing that you mentioned, um, and again in relation to change on the horizon, you mentioned the differences between signing requirements under Scots and English law um, and the requirement under Scots law to print the document off in full, and also that, that bugbear that uh, we need uh, the operative text on the last signing page and that this can often cause issues um, in transactions. I think, though, that we are hopeful that there might be some change on the horizon there too. Um, yes, well, firstly, thank you for the question. And yes, that is right. The Scottish Law Commission have included the execution of documents in their law reform program. So we are expecting a lot of Scots law signing issues to be clarified and modernized. Um, and that includes the requirement to print documents in full. Other areas of possible reform include the aligning execution of documents by overseas companies with UK companies. This will give more flexibility to allow signatures under other countries' conventions. For example, allowing someone to sign with their surname first, which is currently not allowed. What else? Mercury signing processes, which are common in England, um, will also be considered for Scots law documents. So on the horizon, yes, but it is likely that these changes will take some time to be implemented. So for the time being, current signing rules apply. Thanks, Taiba. So positive changes in relation to how we take security and also hopefully on, in relation to how we sign our security and other banking documents. Um, so that brings us to the end of today's session, um, but otherwise, thank you very much for joining us and goodbye.